All right, today we are going to try to look and see if we can find out what's wrong. We have a Carver receiver. These were uh, some of the better made hi-fi uh, receivers in the late 80s, early 90s. I think this is probably in 90s. I've got the cover off already so you can kind of see the internals. Uh, I've got a power supply board there. Uh, there's all your heat sinks. You can see your high power devices. They're kind of hidden down there. What's very nice about this, notice the uh, circuit board. All of the components have their names and locations listed, and you have base collector emitter for the transistors. That makes things much easier to work on. And I do have a schematic and a service manual for this thing. And there's another circuit board over here. It's probably some parts of the tuner, and there's another one underneath there preamp stuff. So the customer is saying that it works in mono, but not stereo, and there's also a ground hum. So that's what we're looking at today, and we're going to see if we can figure out what's going on. I've got some uh, signal generator equipment and an oscilloscope, and we'll, we'll signal trace through it using uh, some of these sections of the schematic that I've printed out. All right, so what I've got here, got about... Just a, a test tone going in uh, about 400 hertz. I got it going into the CD input. And uh, if we try play with the balance control down here, you'll see uh, the right channel appears to be dead. Left channel does work. Uh, I do hear a ground hum. Don't hear anything out of the right, though. Uh, but if I uh, take this mono switch, I get sound out of both speakers. But... One side does sound a little ragged. That right side's not. Yeah, maybe it's just a pot. But definitely uh, confirmed there's some kind of an issue with this thing. So the fact that it works with the mono button on kind of tells me that it's probably something in the preamp section. This uh, device has a preamp and power amp uh, separators in the back, so we're going to take a look at those. So if we take a look back here, we can see that we have uh, power amp inputs. In other words, you can separate the pre and the power. So what I'm going to do is pull these out, and uh, then we're going to apply a signal directly to the power amp inputs and see if things are happy in that configuration. And that will tell us quite a bit. All right, so you can see where I have those jumpers removed, and uh, next we'll hook up a signal. There. All right, kind of loud. But basically, I've got a signal going directly into the power amp, and I've got sound coming out of both speakers. These are just cheap test speakers I use. So the power amp stage is fine, but I'm not hearing the ground up right now, so to me it sounds like there's something wrong with the preamp board. So we'll, uh, we'll try to further investigate what's going on there. That's the conclusion. Okay, so I've re installed the uh, connections between uh, pre and power amp and then I've got my uh, signal going back into the, the CD. Okay so we got this thing uh, back into its uh, configuration when we started and the problem does indeed uh, remain. So what we're going to do is we're going to take a look at the schematic for the uh, input section. Alrighty so I have got the Block diagram open, where the hell's the mouse? So what we're looking at right now, I was coming in through the CD, and then we got this switch function device. And you can see the section, here's where the pre and main break out. So we know the problem from, from this point on forward works. So the issue's got to be back in here somewhere. So we're going to, uh, this is just a high level block diagram. We're going to try to find out a little more about this thing here. And, uh, then we'll move on. So I'll go to the sheet that has that detail. Well, we're in this area. You can see the specifications. Uh, this is supposed to put out 90 watts per channel. Uh, we'll verify that later on when we get back down there and uh, see what it can do. And that's into, what, 8 ohms. Uh, they don't seem to mention one for 4 ohms, but we'll, uh, we'll measure that later. All right, so on the schematic... You can see that is IC802, and you can see where we come in here, goes into that. 
So that's basically a selector device, electronically controlled. Uh, they have their advantages and disadvantages. Big disadvantage is uh, when the part craps out and it goes obsolete, then you've got to modify this whole unit. But we're going to find out. So I can look up what that thing is. What does it say there? TC9152P. 9150, uh, we're going to go look that up on the internet and uh, see what the heck that thing is. Okay, as I kind of expected, it's basically an analog switch. Uh, electronically controlled. There's the pinout. All right, from reading this data sheet, see that COM A, pin 11, and COM B, pin 13, those are the outputs of this chip. So what we're going to go do is go downstairs and put our sine wave in and see if we see a sine wave at the output of those things. Now if we look at this a little closer before we go downstairs, so see here's pin 13. That's an output. So they got 100k to ground. Then notice they come up to these tape monitor switches. So it's possible that one of these switches has got, whoops, I'm up here now. If one of these switches has got a problem, that could screw it up too. And then down below, uh, where the hell's the other output? 11. Same thing. They've got a resistor to ground, 100k. That's fine. That wouldn't have any effect on anything. And then you can see where it comes through some dubbing switches. So we'll go check. First thing we're going to check, 13 and 11, there better be a sine wave out there when I have a sine wave into this point here, up here, sorry. And I have, which that one happens to be CD. When I have CD selected, there better be a sine wave on both here and here. So we are going to go downstairs and confirm that. All right, so we're back down in the lab and... Uh, of course, that chip's not on this board. It's probably buried under there, so I'm going to have to uh, take this other board out of the way in order to find that other chip that I need to get to. All right, so I've removed the screws, and you can see this thing just kind of lifts up, and uh, it's probably, uh, well, it's got to be that big one there, probably. I'll find out for sure, but first thing I want to do, I don't want to just set this board down any old place because if it shorts out against something that it won't be good so let me figure out a way to get that under control and then we'll be back and of course they can't make it easy the part I need is actually underneath here so I've got to dig further all right so I got these other boards up and out of the way it wasn't too hard um, but now you can see down in there that's the chip we want to get to and notice uh a lot of your better uh, devices, you see this long shaft here, that's uh, the tape dubbing. They run the, uh, they keep every, all the circuits are on the board back here, and they have a, a big long control shaft going up to the front. That saves wires from running all the way to the front of the unit if the switch was up there, which uh, can help to uh, cut down uh, extraneous noise pickup, hum, you know, static, anything like that. So a lot of your better uh, units do have features like that. Okay, one thing I had to do is uh, connect a lead from there over to the chassis ground because it wasn't happy, uh, wasn't working properly without that. That's probably the uh, circuit ground for this entire board. But now I've got, I uh, can see the chip down there. And if you're not familiar with these chips, that dimple that you can barely see on the left end, that indicates. Uh, where the pins start, so I need something small to point with. Pin 1 would be that first one right on the end there, so we got to go up to 11 and 13. Um, in the meantime, I've got a, uh, an oscilloscope here which we will look for a sine wave. So uh, let me get things in place and we'll show you that. Alright, right there, that is the sine wave that I'm applying to the unit, just to, uh, just got the scale set up, so that's what, what we're putting into the uh, CD input jack. Okay, over here, very hard to see, but I've got the oscilloscope probe on pin number 11 of that chip, which is the common output, and there is indeed a nice looking sine wave there. So that's a good sign. Uh, now we're gonna check pin 13. 
Okay, now I'm on pin 13, which you can see right down there. It's hard to see, but it's there. And sure enough, we've got a sine wave. So that's a really good sign. That means that that IC is probably fine. Uh, so knowing that, we'll move on to where the signal goes next. Just as a side note, this uh, you can see on the back of the unit here. These are all your audio inputs and dubbing and all that kind of stuff. Uh, they've got this all on this separate board here, and uh, that's that's nice because they're keeping it all tight and in one area, right near the back of the unit, and it's hard to see with my insulator sweater, so away from the power transformer. Uh, you want to keep all, as much as you can, away from uh, things that can generate hum and noise, and transformers uh, tend to do that. Alright, so we're back up here at the schematic. So. We know that uh, pin 13 and 11 have signals, so if you follow this, you'll see it goes up into a tape monitor switch. And if we have that in the off position, then it goes through there, and you will see that it goes up off of this board, and this is the other side. So here are the two channels going off the board, uh, F205 and F206. So next thing I'm going to do is uh, go downstairs and take a look and see if those sine waves are present at that point. And before we go downstairs, just to save a couple of trips, we see where these come out here, F205 and 206, and they go up here, and here's V206 and V205. So now we're going into uh, a preamp board. So we can look at 205 and 206 up here and see if those signals are present at those points. And uh, that will be a, a good indicator of what's going on. So we're going to go do that right now. Okay, remember F205 and 206. Camera down in there. There they are. Now an interesting thing, when I was down here, before I put the camera on, just locating these things, I wiggled this wire and the channel that was out is now working so I'm wondering if there's a bad connection in there so uh, that very well could be but we'll take a look at the signal it's definitely there now uh, I can hear it on the speaker so I almost don't even have to look with the scope I'm trying to get focused one thing I noticed that signal the white one left channel F205 was uh, was kinda tight there's some tension on that wire so that could very well be a problem. And uh, I'm not hearing a ground hum anymore either. Correction. That F wire, F206, the red one, I wiggled it and it basically broke off. So for whatever reason that thing was under a lot of tension. So that is definitely something that's got to be fixed. We'll uh, solder that back up and we'll come back and test it and see if things look better. Okay, well, that was a big pain in the ass. I had to take this board out, and, but it's done. And I uh, haven't put it back together yet, but I always dry test things before you do that, and it does seem to be working. So I'm going to button this thing back up and then we'll check the power output. Okay, so as of right now, this thing is back to get, well, except for the cover. It's buttoned up, the circuit boards, and everything's working. So I unhook the speakers and I've got these uh, dummy loads, 8 ohms, one for each channel. And I'm going to measure, uh, using the oscilloscope, where this thing clips. So I think we got about, what do we got? 400 hertz going in here. Kind of a mid-range frequency and I'll come down here and you want to turn this up until it just starts to okay there's clipping so we're gonna back it down and right about there now if you look at let me get rid of the menu there see that cycle RMS it says 3.09 volts but I've got a 10x probe on here so it's really 30.9 RMS so if you were to square that and then divide it by 8, you will get your power. So I don't have a calculator with me, so I just went off on the phone and did it. And that equates to about 119 watts. And that's uh, both channels driven, 8 ohms. Now it's a resistive load, so it's the easiest load you can get. 
But if I zoom in there, you'll see yeah, right about there, we back it down and uh, all right, 29.8, so right around 30 volts or so it's starting to clip. Now that's at 400 hertz, so let's try a frequency that's a little more, uh, probably going to be more demanding. So we will dial up frequency, and I'll do, where the hell is it, 20 hertz. So this is going to be a much, much longer wavelength. So... Let's see what we get here with 20 hertz. Alright, so you can see it's a tougher, tougher frequency, so we're going to back down. I'd say it's looking pretty clean there. So, yeah, I call it, where's that measuring? That'd be about 29 volts, so uh, I'll run the numbers in a minute, but it's going to be a little less, but I'm sure it's easily going to hit uh, the 90 watts is what it's rated at. So, now we'll try a different frequency. We'll try 20 kilohertz. So we'll come up here and we'll do, where the hell is it? 20 oh, kilohertz. All right, so now we got a much higher frequency, so I'm going to expand this out. Actually, 20 is kind of high. Nobody listens to 20. Let's do, uh, let's do 10,000. 10 kilohertz. All right, so there's our 10 kilohertz waveform. And uh, I can get one or two cycles in there. So we turn this up. Yeah, I'd say it's starting to go. That's starting to not like it there, but right about there, it's pretty good. Uh, and that's actually uh, 33 and change volts. So that's actually putting out more at that high frequency. I don't know what the distortion is. It might be. It looks a little as asymmetrical, but not bad. But this thing's easily meeting its uh, 90 watt requirement. So that's the Carver, I don't know if there's a model number on this thing. I don't happen to see one. The Carver receiver. Uh, the only thing I'll tell you, it's a real pain in the ass, the screws that hold these knobs in place, trying to get those back in there. Uh, I'm going to leave that for my friend to do. That's a pain in the ass and I'll be struggling with it. And I'll start swearing, so I'm going to let him do it. So there we have it, the Carver receiver back in operation. It was a relatively simple problem. Broken wires. Uh, I was kind of hoping for something more challenging, like a bad part, but broken wires will certainly cause problems. Uh, so that's all we got for now, and uh, talk to you later.